Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and again, thanks uh, the organizing committee for uh, inviting me to speak. Um, I've got um, no relations to declare and uh, relationship to declare um, from a disclosure point of view. So just very briefly, um, we know that the um, incidence of rectal um, urine consumers um, have been increasing from 0 0.2 in 73 to 0 0.86 in 2004, most recent SEER data. They represent almost 20% of all uh, urine consumers and about uh, or close to one-third of GI nets in the um, uh, American or North American data, and up to about 15% of in the European population. They're much higher in uh, Asian uh, populations, and this is probably related to real increased incidence in this group, but also um, um, uh, the fact that uh, screening policies for colonoscopy are much more developed in this, in this area. The other thing to remember that they're higher in black and Asian populations as well. Uh, as a true increase. It's important also to realize that about 50% or perhaps more are discovered uh, in, as an incidental finding. And this, of course, is important because what happens is that we find these tumors then in a non-expert community. So they are very often with gastroenterologists or GI surgeons who are doing endoscopy and not necessarily specialized in neuroendocrine tumors. And this creates a problem. There's little data about the accuracy of uh, recording where these tumors are. Um, uh, they're perhaps in the low rectum preferentially, seems to be a tend to be there. And it's also important to state that these are distinguishable from adenomas and hyperplastic polyps if they're looked at carefully. So good gastroenterologists should be able to see that this is not a typical hyperplastic polyp. They're often firm, yellowish, tan, and submucosal in origin. And uh, modern white light endoscopy combined with uh, NBI or FICE should be, should be used and not everything should be just considered as a ditzel or a little small uh, bump uh, that's insignificant. So these are some examples of, um, of lesions that don't resemble um, hyperplastic adenomatous lesions. Uh, they can be polypoid in, in, in certain instances but don't look like adenomas as you can see in the bottom left. And also uh, the press centers uh, as you can see in the center and the bottom uh, with um, um, uh, ulceration can also occur, but these should be uh, dealt with with care. Another important consideration in, in the diagnosis is just uh, inferred from this series of 45 malignant rectal polyps. Uh, half of them are, were neuroendocrine tumors. There's a lack of uniformity in, in reporting in, in the size and the location, the gross description of these rectal polyps. The distance from the polyp to the anal, anal verge is only recorded in 9%. And um, the location is generalized to the rectum. Only two of these lesions, in fact, out of 45 were tattooed. And it was very variable follow-up and incomplete, uh, 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 despite incomplete resections in 15 patients. So you can imagine that if you partially resect one of these lesions, going back in to find it causes a problem because of all of these things. And this is everyday practice. I won't go into this in detail at all because this pathological classification staging is similar to what we've seen before. So we've got the, we've got the WHO 2010 classification, so we're going to call these neuroendocrine tumors based on grading G1, less than 2%, G2, 2 to 20%, and G3, or poorly differentiated um, carcinomas. Um, and we will also um, uh, stage them according to TNM. And this is important because I think the size is critical. And as we'll see, as we've seen with appendiceal, it's also critical for the, for the rectal tumors. So we've got T1 tumors that are mucosal or submucosal, and there's a T1A when it's less than one centimeter, and when it's between one and two centimeters, a T1B, and T2 then greater than two. <clears throat> I want to illustrate um, some of the problems uh, with two cases, and this is the first case of a 51-year-old gentleman who's referred to me as the rectal neuroendocrine tumor following colonoscopy for self-limiting uh, limiting diarrhea. It was described in the outside institution as a six millimeter diameter lesion that was two centimeters above the dentate line, which was hard. And this was a very good young person who recognized this as not an adenoma or hyperplastic polyp and did a biopsy. And this is a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. Chromogranin A uh, was positive, as was NSE. And this is the lesion here when I saw the patient. And this is sort of a firm submucosal lesion that's probably around perhaps about a, a centimeter in size, so a little bit bigger than was initially anticipated. This is the question. I, I can't ask you to vote because I don't have time, but what would you recommend? Chromogranin A, serum chromogranin A here, endoscopic ultrasound staging, standard snare polypectomy, 
an octreo scanner of somatostatin receptor scintigraphy, endoscopic mucosal resection, endoscopic submucosal dissection, or one, two, five, and, uh, and or six. And to give you the answers that what I did, I did perform a chromogranin-A serum which was normal, and this is often the case, in fact, in rectal tumors. It has been written in the literature in the past that serum acid phosphatase can be helpful. I don't know of anybody who uses this, and, I don't, and it's written in the books, but I don't, I, don't, I don't particularly have access to this. I don't think it's useful. Endoscopic ultrasound staging is vital, and this was deemed to be a UT1 N0 uh, 9 millimeter lesion I'll show in a minute. Standard snare polypectomy shouldn't be used, and I'll show you the reasons why that is the case in a, in a, as we develop the talk. An octary scan was negative. It's debatable whether it should be used for a very small lesion that was done here. And uh, endoscopic mucosal resection can be performed. It should be done by an expert. And endoscopic mucosal dissection can be performed as well. So this is an example of the endoscopic ultrasound. And we can see um, the um, lesion up here. And it's 9 millimeters. And it's um, well uh, circumscribed within the submucosa and it's not uh, involving the uh, muscularis propria. So um, it's, it, this was a deemable somatostatin receptor integrity, which was negative. This was deemable resectable. So a full and complete endoscopic mucosal resection was confirmed, confirming this to be PT1A, less than 10 millimeter lesion, well differentiated. K67 was 5% as a G2, and it was fully decised uh, with um, uh, markers here, and you can see this is the on-block um, um, uh, mounted specimen. So what would we do next then? Reassure the patient, no follow-up required, follow-up in six months with rectoscopy, rectoscopy and endorectal EUS in 12 months, other imaging studies, or chromogranin A in 12 months. So it's, um, this is what was sort of done, and these are some of the recommendations according to ENET uh, recommendations. And, uh, and, and follow up. So if, if the tumor is small, less than 10 millimeters, a PT1A, and it's fully excised, and there are no negative features, a bit like in the appendix. So if the K67 is low, G1, we don't really know whether low G2s could be included in that, no further staging would be required. If, however, the tumor is larger, it's recommended to perform an endoscopic ultrasound, Rectal pelvic uh, MRI or CT scan can also be recommended. Abdominal CT to check the liver. However, the cost effectiveness of these measures in terms of um, intermediate sized tumors, uh, T1B, for example, up to T2, is not known. But the option was chosen this patient, having, having discussed it with him, was a rectoscopy and endoscopic ultrasound in a year's time. And this was, both of these examinations were found to be normal. And there was no follow up thereafter. So in justifying some of these, then, you can look at some of the clinical, clinical pathological features. This is a, a series of about 230 patients from Japan. About 57% of patients were male, about 56 years of age. And that fits with the screening colonoscopic um, uh, uh, ages, really. Median size of 7.1, and the um, Asian uh, sizes will be slightly um, smaller because they're screening at an earlier stage, so they'll pick them up earlier as well. And, um, however, central depression within the lesion is recorded up to about 10%, which is a negative prognostic outcome. And the vast majority, more than 97%, were T1A and T1B. Again, there's a bias probably in the Asian series. Second then case to illustrate is this 38-year-old gentleman referred with a history of an incidentally discovered rectal carcinoid, which was described following a snare polypectomy in 2007. It was a 13 millimeter well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor, which was narrowly excised and not involving the muscularis propria, T1B, on the pathology report from outside institution. Follow up CT scan was performed at four months, and it was found to have an isolated perirectal lymph node of 1.5 centimeters. Had an interval CT scan at 10 months, and there was no change in the size of the node. There was a small bit of calcification noted in the node, and was referred for opinion. The patient was perfectly symptomatic. So the review of the uh, MRI shows the node here clearly on the perirectal space on, on the pelvic uh, MRI. Um, it was decided, um, we also reviewed the initial, initial histology and it was a 13 millimeter tumor, PT1B, four mitosis by high power field, the G2, there was no uh, K67 available and we couldn't get the slides to do that. And it was narrowly excised. 
However, we decided to perform an endoscopic ultrasound and biopsy the lymph node, and this was um, found then to have cells consistent with a neuroendocrine tumor. Cytokeratin was positive, as was synaptophysin, and chromogranin was negative, and the K67 and the biopsy fine needle was 3%. We performed an octary scan, and there was fixation both at the level of the lymph node and one lesion in the right lobe of the liver. So the therapy decided upon after multidisciplinary discussion and following MRI of liver with Primavist, where one additional liver lesion in segment six was found, obviously you could do diffusion weighted MRI as well, was to perform a metachronous laparoscopic resection for the rectum and of the liver at a TMR of the rectum and liver metastasectomy. And ever the um, K67 in the final histopathology pathology from the lymph nodes was 10%, so this is a moderately or interme intermediate G2, let's say, and uh, there were similar features in the, in the liver lesions. So this patient went on then to um, undergo a standard follow-up, a six-month follow-up then was found to have uh, vertebral metastasis, very small, and further lesions in the liver, and following um, a period of observation and chemotherapy, further progressed and has been stabilized now after six cures of uh, peptide receptor radon nuclear therapy. But just to illustrate that size matters, we know that um, tumors less than one centimeter has about a 3% metastatic risk, one to two, a 10 to 15, and greater than two, 60 to 80%. So this is very important. In a very recent Korean series of 284 patients, 100% of patients with tumors greater than 15 millimeters had node positive disease, which is very striking. It's also important to note that in a very small subset of patients, probably less than 10% uh, of tumors that are T1A or less than 10 millimeters and uh, node metastasis can occur. So I think the, uh, the, the idea of endoscopic ultrasound is very important. This is also just to confirm the tumor size in a couple of series in multivariate analysis is, is very important. So greater than 10 centimeters for risk of uh, metastatic disease. Also venous invasion is a, a, uh, is, a, is a poor prognostic factor as is lymphatic invasion and these are a multivariate analysis. As I mentioned earlier, we need to be very careful using snare polypectomy. Now, this is a series of 85 patients. 56% of the tumors were less than one centimeter, so it's very small, and endoscopic therapy was performed in 54% of these, more than half. And of those patients who underwent endoscopic therapy, 85% had positive or indeterminate margins. And this is everyday practice, and it's very difficult to know what to do with these patients. There's limited data on the outcome of these patients as well with incomplete or borderline resection. This is another, another series here um, in patients, uh, 160 patients who underwent, 229 patients overall cohort. And just to, to focus on this, this is following uh, patients who underwent endoscopic resection for smaller lesions. And there was 35 patients who had to have radical surgical for either margin positive disease or because they had lymphatic or venous um, uh, resection. So it is a real issue. Endoscopic ultrasound is very useful because it gives us accurate information on the size of these lesions. And you can see in this cohort here, the size was a perfectly linear correlation between endoscopic ultrasound uh, and the final pathological outcome. And also, uh, when we, uh, endoscopic ultrasound and it was also um, able to um, predict and help the resection of these lesions, 100% complete resection versus about the three quarters in a standard group. There's another paper showing um, the, um, and the, the results of uh, the poor results of polyp snare, standard snare polypectomy, about 20% uh, complete resection versus other more advanced techniques and also uh, uh, that endoscopic ultrasound being used was capable of, um, of helping um, the overall outcome and decreasing the risk of leaving in, in, in place tumor. Endoscopic submucosal dissection, as you're all aware, is a difficult technique, but it's very useful for neuroendocrine tumors, and it's been shown here to uh, allow for 100% endoscopic complete resection versus uh, about um, uh, 85%. And histological complete resection is also statistically more uh, um, uh, significant in endoscopic submucosal dissection as opposed to standard EMR techniques. And this is even in allowing for Japanese seri series. And finally, this is a, a large surgical series from Western. This comes from um, uh, Des Winters group in Dublin and, and, and our group, uh, in combined with a prison group and an American, it's a multi-center cohort. 
This was 67% um, of the patients had tumors found as an incidental finding. It's a surgical cord, so there's a little bit more of, um, of T2 disease, about one quarter. Half of them were T1. Endoscopic therapy was performed at about 80, 86 patients, or a little less than half, and surgery then in, in, the, in the others. And it was a ver variety of techniques that were used. Once again, size came out as a very important factor, as well as lymph oh, lymphovascular invasion. The overall five-year survival in this group was 70%, the 10-year survival 60% for node-positive tumors. And if you had distant metastasis, the four-year survival rate decreased to 38%. And these are, the, these are just the, the, the Meyer plots looking at T1 and once again emphasizing the importance of size. So what about photo post-resection then? And the recommendations from ENETS uh, are the following, the tumors less than one centimeter that are T1A, N0, and um, that are G1, or perhaps G2. There's no data to recommend regular follow-up on these patients. If there are small tumors with G3, which will be a very rare occurrence, then obviously follow-up is imp important as annual and as per adenomas. If tumors are between one to two centimeters, that is G1, and uh, they are <coughs> G1 to G3, the annual follow-up should be performed uh, as per adenomatous uh, uh, polyposis uh, type follow-up. And for tumors greater than two centimeters, then these need also annual surveillance as per adenomatous surveillance and uh, G3 for larger tumors every four to six months at least. And this type of procedures are endos endoscopic ultrasound, colon colonoscopy, MRI, and um, liver examination using standard techniques, but with um, contrast medium and multi-slice CT scan uh, should be also used. The prognosis for advanced disease is um, the five-year uh, the overall five-year stage for, for, four, for stage four disease is 15 to 30 percent, and for advanced disease less than stage four, it's somewhere between 50 to about 70. Although it is also reassuring to show this slide that the um, overall uh, five-year survival, according to SEER data, has increased with time as we're um, probably detecting these lesions better in resection than before they uh, become uh, more advanced. And for therapy, in terms of advanced stage four disease, for well-differentiated um, nets of the tumor G1 and G2, there's inadequate data to support standard, a standardized approach. Um, and for G3 tumors, there's poorly differentiated in G3 cisplatin-based regimens, as we heard before. Again, a need for trials in stratifying patients and combining groups. Uh, and tumors with strong somatostatin uptake can be considered for PORT. So then in summary, for tumors that are less than one centimeter and one to two without risk factors, I think that these can be subjected to endoscopic mucosal resection, or perhaps even better, endoscopic submucosal dissection. Some cases, transrectal uh, 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 endoscopic uh, resection. Um, and if the endoscopic resection fails, then local resection and local excision can be performed. For tumors that are less than two centimeters with risk factors, which include higher um, ulcerated lesions, obviously a high K67, or a predicted node positive or PT2, then an oncological resection should be performed, and for, as uh, should be the case for tumors that are greater than two centimeters. So in conclusion, these are frequent GI neuroendocrine tumors. They need better recognition, especially in the Western population. Uh, accurate local staging is important, and I've underlined the importance of endoscopic ultrasound. And um, for patients with locally advanced or stage four disease, then I think that the usual staging procedures uh, with MRI, CT, rectum, and then somatostatin receptor scintigraphy or PET-CT, a gallium, uh, can be um, used. Um, specialized resection is recommended for small tumors. Uh, with local resection, I think that we should be performing these endoscopically with expert type endoscopic mucosal resection or ESD, oncological resection for larger tumors, and there's little data regarding to systemic um, therapy, and this is um, uh, performed according to grade. Thank you for your attention.